Now, statins are something that's very important in the management of diabetes. There's not so much about it in this year's EASD program, so we thought we'd talk to a statins expert. So welcome, Bart van den Schuren. Oh, I so, I so struggle with Dutch names. Um, Anyway, hello to you. This is Bart van der Schuren from uh, Leuven. Uh, uh, but it's really important that people living with diabetes have their uh, uh, cholesterol and their triglycerides controlled. Statins are a key in their management, aren't they? Oops, I think we think, unfortunately, we're not hearing you at the moment. Oh, you're not hearing me? Ah, uh, now we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, indeed, um, I think that uh, statin treatment, most of uh, patients living with diabetes should be on a statin treatment, especially when they're over the age of 40 and especially when they have long-standing diabetes. And I think that one of the things that happened um, is that um, um, in view of the recent uh, very good results of cardiovascular outcome trials, with GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT, SGLT inhibitors, we sometimes tend to forget that all of these patients in these cardiovascular outcome trials are also treated uh, stringently in terms of their lipid profile. And so keeping a statin on board in patients with diabetes is absolutely um, essential, at least in most of the, of the patients. One should always think, why is this patient not on a statin rather than should he be on a statin? Um, and um, what's also very important is that statins have got some bad press. Um, bad press because of, first of all, the fact um, that they are so commonly used that side effects are often discussed in the media or amongst people. Um, and this often leads to stopping statins uh, when, for example, there is muscle ache or when people um, have the impression they don't uh, tolerate their statin very well. I think it's always important um, to emphasize to the patients that um, diabetes in itself puts them at risk of stroke, puts them at risk of myocardial infarction, and that one of the main goals of treating their diabetes um, is... Um, to prevent that from happening, and that we can do that by choosing the right drugs, such as DLP-1 receptor agonists, et cetera, to control their glycemia, but that we also need to take the entire metabolic picture of the patient uh, into uh, the screening, that we should also um, address the, the lipid profile uh, by using statins. And so I think statins are often stopped when they're not well tolerated. Um, and important to add is that the um, ECS guidelines on where it should, you should go with LDL lowering in uh, patients living with diabetes have become more stringent so that we need to actually have, um, when we want to treat to target, a lot of our patients with diabetes should be below uh, 1.4 millimoles per liter or 55 milligrams per deciliter in LDL um, and, um, or uh, below at least 1.8. So I think that there is a bit of a disconnect between the fact that uh, ECS guidelines and uh, AISD guidelines as well really emphasize the fact that we need uh, statins in the background treatment of most of our patients living with diabetes, but that patients often don't understand is that there is a lot of emphasis on control of glycemia. There has been a lot of, and this is a, a good thing, a lot of publicity around the great cardiovascular effects of SGLT inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, but it should not be forgotten that all of these trials were on a background of well-controlled uh, lipids with statins. So really, Bart, there's some psychology here, isn't there? In other words, it's got to be emphasized to the patient that, as you said, this is a whole package. And I think that when people see, you know, so many of their friends and neighbors who take statins, particularly once they reach the age of about, you know, 55, 60, they assume that actually somehow it's not so important. But what you're saying is that you really have to tell patients that they are an essential part of 
their drug regime, that it's not a case of that they can have the, the glucose uh, lowering, but not the, the kind of leave the other one out? Yeah, I think exactly. Um, patients with diabetes, sh it should be emphasized to them that it's not only about controlling glucose. Of course, that's already a major task, but actually controlling lipids is relatively easy. It just takes a pill a day. And if this pill is well tolerated, uh, it's way easier uh, to control a lipid profile than a, a, a glycemia uh, profile, which is much more variable. Um, so therefore, um, I think it's an easy way of, of um, making their risk on a stroke myocardial infarction less. It's, it's uh, way easier than controlling glycemia. But statins have had bad press in the past. And one of the reasons in diabetes pro that they had bad press is also that um, I, I think everybody remembers that a few years ago, um, it also became apparent that statin use, especially in the Jupiter trial, was associated with an increased risk of developing diabetes. So this is also something that has had a lot of press, but should be contextualized. So um, when looking at the benefit risk ratio of statins in patients with diabetes, this benefit risk ratio is very, very towards the benefit rather than the risk especially in terms of that diabetes risk that's associated with statin use. So to say, um, if you treat 250 patients with a statin, um, one of these patients may develop um, diabetes in the course of the following years, whereas it will prevent nine of the patients from doing a major a cardiovascular event such as a myocardial infarction. That's a really good way. So of, can... That's a really good way of putting it. But but also it shouldn't be forgotten that there's a really you know you've got a lot of statins at your disposal. You don't have to just prescribe you know one particular one. There are quite a range of them. And I wondered what you thought about the newer range of cholesterol lowering drugs. Um, there's you know the the, the ones that you can uh, in, in, inject. Um, they're, m they're more expensive, but um, there are those. There, there are other things like a Cosopend uh, FR coming on the uh, market. So, what other things? You know, what's the? Where do you start? What dosage do you start with? Um, are there any particular considerations, for instance, in those who already have familial hypercholesteremia, plus diabetes? Where do you? What's your starting point? Well, I think a good starting point is to uh, start with a low dose statin is the cheapest option. Uh, it's also um, the option that will um, eventually be best tolerated. So if you start immediately at a very high dose, the risk of uh, adverse uh, effects is, is, is bigger. So start low, but then try to up titrate to treat the targets and the targets for patients with diabetes are rather stringent. So often you will have to up titrate to a high intensity statin, such as rosuvastatin or uh, abtorvastatin. Um, what's very important as well to know is that when a side effects seem to occur, like for example, if you have an elevation of CKs, and this is often what happens in the clinic, that patients, when they have uh, type 2 diabetes, we, have, we, we also encourage them to move more, and that will affect CK levels, and then sometimes, uh, statins are stopped because CKs are elevated, but this is, for example, after uh, the patient did physical exercise. So we should realize as physicians that CK uh, levels are relatively unstable and that if your CK levels are not above five times the upper limit, that doesn't really mean you need to stop the statin. If the statin doesn't suffice to treat to target, it's a very good option to add uh, um, azetamide uh, to the treatment in which you will get uh, a further lowering. It's often more effective, by the way, to add azetamide uh, to the uh, statin treatment than to higher the dose of statin. So often when you don't, don't maximize your statin always, but you can um, add azetamide as, a, as another option and that doesn't have any effect on uh, a muscle. So that's a, a good thing. And then in terms of the PCSK9, uh, inhibitors. I think they're a very interesting and very powerful tool uh, to lower LDL uh, cholesterol, as we all know. And I do want to make a little um, uh, publicity for 
um, a presentation that was on this year AI Day um, platform. It's uh, by the uh, Bruno Verges from the University of uh, Dijon. Uh, and he showed that, for example, treatment with the reglutide actually um, lowers LDL cholesterol and that uh, the way it does that is probably true um, affecting the PCSK9 uh, level. So even um, the GLP-1 receptor agonists somehow affect PCSK9 uh, and may uh, derive some, some of the benefits on cardiovascular disease may derive uh, from that effect. Um, so, but uh, these can certainly be used, but of course, in view of their price and in view of the number of um, patients with diabetes, I think they're best reserved for people who really don't tolerate um, uh, other uh, forms of treatment. There is also the benthodoic acid uh, that's coming to the market shortly um, to treat those that are statin intolerant. So I think there's a lot of um, options within the statins. Always try to have a, a statin on board because most of the evidence is from statins and patients that were at least treated in the background with statins. But do not hesitate if you don't get to target to add to that azetamide, to add uh, a PCSK9 inhibitor and if, if needed, um, or um, uh, to use them pedoic acid if statins are really uh, not possible to use. And there is an issue, isn't there, with a lot of people who take statins, that if the cholesterol is not lowered, that the physician says, if he lived in the Netherlands, ah, you've, spil you've still been eating lots of cheese. <laughs> you haven't mm -hmm. cut back on your cheese habit. That's why your cholesterol levels are still high. But actually, sometimes that is not the case. The patient has been compliant. They are taking the cholesterol-lowering drugs. And you should give the patient, I guess, the benefit of the doubt and not assume that they've gone back to their old cheese-eating ways. <laughs> But, it, but that maybe the cholesterol, the statin that you're giving them is not the right statin and you need to escalate. Yeah, I think it's always best to trust the patient. If the patient says he's taking a treatment, then usually, um, although it's difficult to be compliant with the treatment, as we all know, but uh, usually uh, he is. And then the best way is to switch to another statin or another form of treatment to see whether that has an effect. In terms of emphasizing very much the diet, I think we should be a little bit um, careful with that. Um, on the triglycerides, diets have, have, have relatively large effects. Um, so there you can uh, help with a more stringent diet. On LDL cholesterol in itself, a diet doesn't have that much effect. So even with a stringent diet that's poor in cholesterol, for example, you see um, levels that drop by 6%, but nothing near to what you can have with a statin, because this is also something that a lot of patients come with. They say, well, let me try through diet, but I think we should clearly emphasize that uh, through diet, you cannot really um, expect um, really large reductions of LDL cholesterol or um, reductions that are close to what you clinically need to attain uh, to have this uh, beneficial effect on cardiovascular health. And of course, you should also advise them about diet. There are quite a lot of people on statins who, when you question the huge piece of pie or cake or whatever it is they're having, they'll say to you, it's all right, I'm on statins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but OK, but the huge uh, piece of cake uh, or whatever will also um, negatively affect their weight, will negatively affect their glycemic control. So there's other reasons why they should keep away from that. And of course, a statin doesn't, a statin does not in itself um, diminish the need for yeah, other measures to do a glycemic control and diminish the need also to control other cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, uh, such as overweight, obesity. So um, yes, I think that um, people living with diabetes have a, have a tough, tough task. They first of all have the task to control uh, their glycemia and to, to, to be under good glycemic control, but they also uh, have the task of um, uh, these other things, and that is to keep their cardiovascular risk as low as possible, because we still know that despite all the efforts we're doing, that patients with diabetes are still at a double risk, at least, uh, almost, of um, having cardiovascular uh, disease and uh, mortality because of cardiovascular disease. And I think we have made great progress there. And especially with the newer drugs, we have 
um, for glycemic control, SGLT inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists. There is progress, and this is all good, but it should not be forgotten that this progress is in part because of these new drugs, but also because patients are treated better in terms of all their other risk factors, such as smoking, hypertension, and lipid control. So, so that's that very strong message from you, Bart, that actually, you know, you really have to check. That's one of the first things that the diabetologist should check, that it, there are stat statins have been prescribed, not assume the GP or general uh, practitioner has done it. And, and also, I think there's something else here, which is about blame. Is, uh, I, I think people living with diabetes often feel blamed for their condition. And actually, uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs and statins, there's another aspect also they feel blamed, that somehow they're, they're at fault. So, you know, taking statins needs to be taken into the, into the, the general medication package. And ma people living with diabetes made to feel that they are not at fault, that they are not being blamed for their lifestyle, that they are being helped and they can do, that statins are really an, a, a very helpful part of their, of their uh, medication. Yeah, I think that is indeed very important because I think that uh, blame and guilt over a disease is seldom a way of getting good compliance. And I think that's very, um, very necessary in the field of diabetes, but also in the field of obesity, for example, that um, blaming or uh, putting guilt with the patient is, is not helpful at all in making him more compliant with the treatment. A more positive attitude is often way more efficient. And as we all know, um, um, even though lifestyle, of course, plays a role in uh, the pathophysiology of uh, type 2 diabetes and also actually um, potentially of um, uh, type 1 diabetes, or at least that, uh, of how uh, type 1 diabetes evolves, and for example, how the weight of patients with type 1 diabetes evolved during their insulin treatment. It's still important to, 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 to realize also as a physician that lifestyle is not um, something that people always choose. A lot of people don't, you, you don't 100% choose your lifestyle. Of course, you can do um, all you can to, to be as... Um, compliant as possible with treatments, to be as compliant as possible with uh, diet, uh, with uh, physical exercise. But we all know that life is a bit more convoluted than that and that often things come between good intentions and what actually happens. In the world. Th that's been a, such a helpful overview of statins, but I'm r really grateful to you. Now, I'm going to ask you to sign out to yourself because I want you to say your name. And I want everyone listening to appreciate how beautiful <laughs> Dutch can <laughs> sound when it's, when it's presented properly. So, so say goodbye. <laughs> this is okay, so um, bye from me. So I was Bart van der Schuren. I'm an endocrinologist at the University of Leuven. In and we've been delighted to have you. But thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, very, very useful. And there's lots more to come.